So as we enter this Thanksgiving season, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you. Thank you, the church, for your graciousness with me. I had an emergency last, last week that I had to travel down to, to be at the memorial service for my friend and former associate pastor at the church that I came from before. He was an associate pastor friend of mine, Pastor Don Soul, but he was also like a mentor at the same time. And so it was really a, a cool relationship. And he's with the Lord today. And so thank you for your graciousness. Thank you for Patrick stepping in at the last second to, to preach last week. And thank you so much for all of this. I love what you've done with the church. I absolutely love the Christmas decorations. I love how it all looks. Who's, who, who took part in that? I want to know. How many of you all were taking part in that? that? It's amazing. Thank you. Give yourselves a hand. For those who don't know me, I'm um, Andrew Leisure. I'm the pastor here. I've been here about four years, and we've been excited to see what God is doing in our church. And as I was preparing this message, I was trying to think, what, what should I preach on? What, what can I do to remind us of a Thanksgiving season? But then at the same time, I've got these questions coming in. People are saying, hey, Andrew, I don't understand why you do a threefold communion. I don't understand this whole thing, and I really don't understand the really icky thing called foot washing. Some of you are like, I don't like touching my own feet, much less someone else's. So this morning, I want to talk to you about, about Thanksgiving, and I want to tie in this understanding of explaining the, the, the foot washing portion of our threefold communion and understand how it's a thankful opportunity, how it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a time of reflection and gratitude. It's, it's a picture of thankful hands and thankful hearts. Well, what does it look like to live? I love babies. Love them. What does it look like to live as a disciple of Jesus? Well, it looks like a person who lives out of thankfulness. You believe that? If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you've committed your life to Christ, if you've called on the name of the Lord and you've been saved, being a disciple looks like someone who is living out of a, a place of thankfulness. It's living with thankful hands in the things that we do. And those thankful hands, the things that we do, are sparked from a thankful heart in the way that we are. Because in Jesus Christ, we're given a new heart. We're given a renewed mind through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so thankful hands and thankful hearts is what it looks like to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And now this morning, you see on the stage here this awesome, look at this pumpkin thing. This is cool, isn't it? How many of you like decorations for Thanksgiving? I know we're ahead of ourselves with Christmas, but that's me. I love Christmas. But yeah, you guys, you guys like Thanksgiving stuff? This, can you see what that says? Can you read it? Give thanks. Give thanks. Well, we've also got something here. This is our basin for foot washing. Now, I'm going to need a volunteer. And actually, Josh, will you come up here? Will you grab, grab that chair on the corner, please? Come on up. I want you all to understand what the foot washing looks like. Just go ahead and take it on the stage here. And sit it right here, facing that way. There we go, my man. All right, so, yeah. Will you have a seat? Will you take your shoes off? Hey, don't act like it doesn't bother you. This guy goes barefoot all over his property. Like, every chance he has to take his shoes off, this is what, this is what he's about. Yeah, socks off. Take your socks off, yes. No, I'm going to wash your socks. Come on, man. All right, so I want, I want to demonstrate. I want to demonstrate uh, the awkwardness of this, the, the beauty in this, uh, the humility in this, the service in this, and what it looks like to wash someone's feet. You see, because we know that Jesus did this. Go ahead and turn on your Bibles while I'm getting set up to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Jesus did this the night before he was to be crucified. John chapter 13. 
So I'm just going to demonstrate here what this looks like. So we've got these downstairs. We're going to have these uh, these warm, wet cloths. Sorry, sorry, Josh. This is not warm. This is cold. But and I'm and what it looks like. If you can't see, you can stand up in the back. But what it looks like to wash someone else's feet and why. So go ahead and uh, give me your foot. Actually, no, I can't do this. Actually, I was going to wash his feet, but I've got concerns. Josh has been talking about me behind my back. He's been criticizing me. He's been slandering me. And I know that after this, he's going to continue doing this. He's going to betray me. He's not going to be loyal. He's just going to go behind my back. So what should I do? You see, I'm, I'm all set to wash Josh's feet. You know, you're going to be at a Thanksgiving table this week. You're going to be sitting with people who've betrayed you. You're going to be sitting with people who have hurt you, who have criticized you. You're going to be sitting with people that you've had arguments with. You're going to be sitting with people bracing, knowing that an argument is coming. What do you do? How do you respond? I'm here to tell you that we should respond in thanksgiving into the way that Jesus responded to the betrayer on the night that he was betrayed. Judas Iscariot, we know the name. The one who betrayed Jesus, who turned him into the authorities, who, who kissed him on the cheek for 30 shekels. He, he was the one. Jesus went into this opportunity. He went into this moment and he looked at Judas, a person that he knew was going to betray him. And this is what he did anyway. He grabbed his feet and he said, Judas, I love you and I'm going to wash your feet. And so he washed his feet in spite of what Judas had done spite of what Judas was going to do. You see, and as we go into this Thanksgiving season, I want us to keep this front and center. I want us to understand what it means to wash someone's feet, what it, what it means to be humbly servant, serving someone else. Why we do it. Yes, it feels like a strange custom, but I've got, I've got to be honest. I'm going to explain this a little bit later. It was a strange custom for regular people to wash other people's feet in Jesus' time, much less the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, Josh. You're all set. You can grab that. Go ahead and get down there with the kids. You don't have to put your shoes and socks on. So, now I've, I've got this up here, and I've, I've got this basin. So that we understand, I want us to keep this in mind as we think about Thanksgiving. We're thinking about everything that Jesus has done for us. We're being thankful for who Jesus is, for who Jesus was, for who Jesus will continue to be. But we have to remember what he's done. We have to remember that he was the king of kings, Lord of lords, the one who created everything and said, I'm going to get down and wash your feet. Because we need to follow that example. The greatest way that we can show that we're living as disciples of Jesus Christ is to live out thankfulness for what Jesus has done for us. Do you get it? We're all Barabbas. We're all the people that need to be pardoned by Jesus. We're all the people that needed Jesus to stand in the gap. And that's what we're going to look at today in John chapter 13. So why do we, as a congregation as Bridge Church, as the Caris Fellowship, include foot washing into our communion service? Why do we add this other element? Well, look in your Bibles in John chapter 13 and look at verse 14. And will you stand with me? John 13, verse 14. I want to read this and you can follow along. John 13, 14. 
Jesus is speaking. He had just washed their feet. Why do we as a Karis Fellowship do this? He says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Thank you. you may be seated. As we're downstairs this morning or a little bit in this afternoon, we're trying to understand why we do the things that we're doing, why we participate in a threefold communion. We do it because Jesus said we should. We do it because he set an example for us. We do it because we're living from a place of thankful hands and thankful hearts, right? Here's the thing. Just so you know, Josh was not talking about me. For those that are here and don't know, Josh is an amazing, amazing guy. And I don't think for a second that he's talking about me behind my back. He's criticizing me. But for the sake of the illustration, we need to understand what it was like for Jesus in, in the face of death to wash the feet of Judas. Thanksgiving isn't just about gratitude. It's about a heart that's willing to serve others because Jesus served others. It's about a heart that's willing to serve even when it's hard. Look at this. Thankfulness is loving when it's hard. See, it's really, really easy to love someone when they're doing great with you, right? It's really easy to love someone who's being kind. It's really easy to love someone who is loving you back. It's really hard to love the person who is hurting you. Last week when, I, when Katie and I were down in South Carolina and Aiken at my former church, I, I was sad to be at the memorial service. But I, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say I was a little bit nervous going into that environment because the last time I was there, I was hurt severely by many people. And I had to, I had to pray and put myself in, in a space of forgiveness to be around some of the people that I knew I was going to see that were going to hurt me. And I had to choose to forgive. I had to choose to love them even though it was hard. Because how many of you have been wronged and you, and you really have a hard time with that person? Like, yeah. Okay, so the rest of you have never been wronged in your whole life. But it's really hard to love when it's hard. It's really easy to love when it's easy. And Jesus showed that thankfulness is loving When it's hard, look at these first two verses, John 13, verses one and two. It says this. It was just before the Passover festival. Okay, so the Passover festival was this festival that Jews practiced every single year. And they practiced it in in response and remembrance and as a reminder of what God did all the way back in Exodus when they were slaves in Egypt and he and he rescued them from Egypt. And the very last plague was when he when the angel of death came through and killed the firstborn in all the land, and God said, look, if you put the blood of the Passover lamb over your doorpost, you will be spared. Your firstborn will be spared. And so the Israelites did it. They all did it. And so Jesus spared them. So God spared them. So after that, what he did was he said, now I want you to practice this every year, this understanding to remind you of the Passover lamb. And what the Passover lamb was doing was pointing forward to Jesus Christ, who was ultimately going to be the amazing, perfect Passover lamb that when, when we put metaphorically his blood over our door, doorposts, it is freedom forever. It is sacrificial blood that wipes us clean forever. It is a place that puts us in right standing with God, positionally justified forever. It was perfect. And so they're practicing this meal, but they don't understand that this Passover festival is pointing completely forward to Jesus Christ. But it says here, it says it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We're about to jump into Christmas when we celebrate that he came down as a baby. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And here he's gone through 33 years of his life and he's walking through these steps and it says he knew that it was time for him to go. He knew that his death was imminent. He knew it was time for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And it says this, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I 
italicize and bold things just for, for sake of clarity so we can understand what we're looking at here. But it says, having loved his own, he loved those he was with. He loved his 12 disciples. And it says he loved them to the end. And in the Greek, that can mean he loved them to the end of his life or he loved them to the uttermost parts of his being. He loved them with everything that he had. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them with every ounce of his being and every ounce of his fiber. And then the next verse. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. He loved his disciples. He loved his own all the way to the end with everything that he's got. But there's this guy that was prompted by Jesus' number one enemy, Satan. Prompted by him to betray him. Judas had been traveling around for three years with Jesus been hearing all of his teachings. And if we read in other passages earlier, when, when the disciples are referring to Jesus and, and Jesus is asking who they are and all these different things, they're, they're calling him Lord, Lord, Lord. And Jesus, Judas only calls him teacher because he listened to what he said. He heard the words. He took in the knowledge, but he never made him Lord of his life. But here in this moment, it says the evening meal was in progress. Jesus was loving his disciples with everything that he had. He loved them to the end. Jesus, J Jesus didn't wait for Judas to deserve love. He chose to love Judas. For God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus. Thankfulness is loving when it's hard, and man, if Je Jesus, man, he proved it. Getting down, we're going to see this later in this passage, and washing Judas's feet. Man, it's easy to wash the people's feet around me that I love, but my goodness, to get on my knees for someone who is hurting me, not easy. Not easy. Loving someone difficult, like maybe there's a coworker who undermines you. You've been there? Maybe you've got a coworker who's a one-upper. <laughs> you know, you've got a friend, you've got a friend in school who's a one-upper. Every time you do something well and somebody uh, congratulates you and says, hey, good job, and gives you your kudos, you've got this other person. Well, I, I, I did this thing. Man, loving that person in that moment, it feels trivial, but it's hard. But if we're thankful for who Jesus is, for what Jesus has done for us specifically, then those things... They won't matter enough to keep us from loving that person. They won't matter enough for us to keep us from serving that person. Maybe there's a family member who's wronged you. Thankfulness is loving when it's hard. Why? Because Jesus loved when it was hard. We need to show our gratitude just like he did. By loving even when it's hard. What, 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 do we, what do we need to know here? Well, the, a grateful heart chooses love over bitterness. Do you believe that? A grateful heart chooses love over bitterness even when that love is undeserved. Because how in the world is that criminal? How in the world is that person who's hurt me and talked about me? How in the world is that person who's hurt my kids or my spouse or my friend? How in the world can I love them? Because gratefulness is about choosing love over bitterness. Jesus had, the Jesus had the opportunity to choose bitterness, to snub Judas in that moment. But we're going to see that he didn't. He still knelt to the floor and washed his feet. What an example. So as you're sitting around the table this Thanksgiving or even going into Christmas, Maybe, maybe your family is a family that there's a lot of tension. You know, maybe the, the tensions are running high. It's a difficult thing. Maybe you've got that relative there who always criticizes. Like, like what's that uncle's name in Home Alone? Remember that uncle that was always critical? Frank, Uncle Frank, yeah. Maybe you've got an Uncle Frank. 
Maybe you've got someone who's constantly bringing up the past, the things that have hurt you, or the way that you've hurt them. We've got to approach this holiday season, this Thanksgiving, with the same love for others that Judas, that Jesus, Jesus showed for Judas. Because a grateful heart chooses love over bitterness, even when it's undeserved. So true thanksgiving isn't just being thankful for the easy relationships. Why? Pastor Andrew, why should I be thankful for the difficult relationships? Because when we're thankful for the difficult relationships, it gives us the opportunity to be like Jesus, to be a disciple who chooses love over bitterness in that moment. You see, we wouldn't have the opportunity to prove to Jesus that we love him. We wouldn't have the opportunity to prove to Jesus that we're thankful for him if we don't have the opportunity to have those things show up when things aren't right. We should be thankful for those difficult relationships because it's an opportunity to love. It's an opportunity to love when it's hard, to love like Jesus. If Jesus could love Judas, like seriously, like if Jesus could love Judas who betrayed him to death, like literally, betrayed him to death. If Jesus could love Judas who betrayed him to death, we can love people who inconvenience us, who offend us. Man, I I remember there was a time that there was this um, neighbor of my wife's and her her mom before we were married, and, and they were extremely racist. Extremely. They did everything they could to get them out of the apartment complex. Sorry for bringing this up, Katie, but Get them out of the the place that they were. They slashed my tires. They slashed their tires. They would make complaints to the to the the people who were in charge, make up stuff just to get them out. And I gotta tell you, I was so, so angry. So bitter. It's hard to love in those situations. But if I'd have thought. Actually, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to egg those people's cars. I wanted to go back to the high school days when all my friends did that, and I wasn't the one who threw the eggs, even though I was in the car with the eggs. No, I'm kidding. I, I did it. I was bad. But I, I didn't give in to throwing the eggs, but I still harbored the bitterness. But I wish that I'd have thought even more about what Jesus did for me and how he washed my feet, even though I'd betrayed him. See, a grateful heart chooses love over bitterness, even when that love is undeserved. So as we look at this idea of thankfulness, what does thankfulness look like? It looks like loving when it's hard, but it also looks like serving when it's inconvenient or beneath you. Like washing someone's feet, like it's literally physically beneath you. Like I gotta get down, right? But it's an inconvenience. So what does it look like to wash feet metaphorically in someone's life? What does it look like? Well, it can be inconvenient, and it can definitely be beneath you. There are things that you feel like, I've got to do this. Well, I'm, I'm too much above that. Like that, that should be for somebody else. Like I've reached this status in my life. I shouldn't be there. But thankfulness, Jesus showed us the kind of love we should have, the kind of servant's heart we should have, serving when it's inconvenient or beneath you. Look at verses 3 through 5. It says here, um, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to... Jesus knew he was God in the flesh. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus knew, like, hey, God the Father is putting everything in place for you to have all the power in the world to do what it is that you've been called to do. And it says, and he knew that his time had come from God and that he was returning to God, so he got up from the meal and he struck Judas down. No. He got up from the meal and he defeated Satan in a moment. No. It says he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing. He took off his garment and 
he wrapped a towel around his waist. Jesus, the king of kings who had all the power, all the, all the strength, all the authority to do what he, could want, what he wanted to do in that moment. To, to strike down everyone who'd hurt him. To strike down everyone who would betray him. To immediately cast Satan into the lake of fire. To do all these things. It says Jesus, Jesus got up from where he was eating and he put on the clothes of a servant. A lowly servant but but that that language of of he he took off his outer clothing he took off his robe and he put himself in a position of the people who are nobodies walking around the table he put himself in a position of someone whose their job was for the people who couldn't do anything else like you're not smart enough to do this over there You're not skilled enough to do that woodwork. You're not even smart enough to stir the drinks. you got to be the one who washes the feet. This was for the worst of all, all all the servants. In fact, it was looked down upon so greatly by the Jews that they were like, I don't even want Jewish slaves, servants to do this. It's got to be Gentiles. It has to be non-Jews. It has to be people that aren't our people have to be the ones that wash the feet as a custom for people who came into the homes. And so this was a regular custom for people that would come into homes because they walked around with their sandals or whatever and it was really dirty outside and it was gross and they're going along and so people will wash their feet. The servants will wash their feet. And it says after that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This is, a, this is an amazing picture of kingly servanthood. It's not a mistake that God put these three verses together. Jesus was in a place where the Father had put all things under his power. And Jesus says, I'm going to wash some feet. Thankfulness is about serving when it's inconvenient or beneath you. Right? Because when we're thankful, it makes it easy to wash people's feet. It makes it easy to go out on a limb for someone who's been difficult towards you. It makes it easy to be patient. I'm not saying easy. It makes it easier to be patient with someone who doesn't deserve your patience. Thankfulness is serving when it's inconvenient or beneath you. When we're at the Thanksgiving table this week, we've got to remember that. As we're stuffing our faces full of food, and we're completely full and we're going back for thirds, we've got to remember. True thankfulness is serving when it's inconvenient. You see, Jesus in this moment, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus in this moment didn't say, well, why me, God? Jesus said, how can I help? He didn't say, why me? He said, how can I serve? I came to seek and to save those who are lost, Jesus said. So as you think of like, uh, let's think of of Thanksgiving and let's think of the chaos of Thanksgiving dinner. Um, I'm picturing right now the chaos and and I know it's a Christmas, a Christmas story. But remember, they made the turkeys and the dogs are running all over the place and they lost everything. And it was just it was just an absolute it was total chaos. So I want you to think of a Thanksgiving environment that's full of chaos. There's dishes that are piling up. There's food burning, burning. There are kids arguing because the kids always argue when we're trying to do the most important thing. Right. They're always fighting with each other. What if you stopped in the middle of preparation for Thanksgiving lunch, Thanksgiving dinner? What if you stopped right in the middle of everything? Turkey's burning. And you wash someone's feet. Because Jesus did that. You see, Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. He came to teach and to tell them about the kingdom of heaven. He came to love them to his death. And in that moment, in the midst of knowing all this stuff was piling up, he said, how about I wash your feet? 
Thankfulness is serving when it's inconvenient. Because nothing is inconvenient on, on God's time clock. Those moments that God puts before us, those opportunities, are not an inconvenience. They are an opportunity. Jesus didn't complain about the inconvenience of washing feet. He saw it as an opportunity to serve. This Thanksgiving, I challenge you to serve someone who doesn't deserve it or can't repay you. No quid pro quo in this environment. Thanksgiving, thankfulness is not about quid pro quo. It's about serving from a place of thankfulness. Serving from a place of gratitude. You know, when we look at Jesus, we, he, he personified this idea that, um, where are we at? I got to continue reading here. It says, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. We know Peter, right? Peter was like your, your jock friend, captain of the basketball team, captain of the football team. He was front of the army that just went charging into everything. He's, he's, he's the guy. He's the brute, brute force guy. He's the guy who, who, who acts before he thinks. He's in this moment, and Jesus, and he, Jesus says, I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to put myself in this place of humility and service. And Peter says no. I mean, understandably. I mean, Peter, on some level, understands that Jesus is God, right? He understands something's going on. He's seen miracle after miracle of Jesus. He knows that Jesus is super special. And so, I mean, think about it for a second. If, if right now where you're seated, if Jesus showed up in front of you right now and said, I want to wash your feet, how would you feel about it? It's one thing to be like, this is Jesus. This is pretty cool. Like, this is awesome. It's another thing to be like, but Jesus, I just um, betrayed you last night. I said yes to that sin. I talked about that. And you're going to wash my feet? No. <laughs> you, shall, you shall never wash my feet. And then Jesus says, unless I wash you, you've no, no part with me. He says, you can't be one of mine. You can't be connected with me. You can't be in a real life relationship with me unless I wash you. And then, and then so Peter says the thing which we would probably all think, all right, Jesus, all right, all right. You want to wash my feet? Then Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And wash the whole thing. I want to be forever clean. Fix me up, Jesus. We're going to get into what that looks like in a second, but Jesus continued in this place of humility. I don't know, I lost a slide in here somewhere, but I want you to understand that humility isn't about who deserves it. It's about who needs it. When Jesus was in, on his knees, and he's washing these disciples' feet, whose feet did he wash? Judas, Peter, James, John, Andrew. We look at this situation and we say Judas was the bad one. See, we know he's later on going to betray Jesus for money. He's going to turn him in. But Jesus, a few chapters later, says, hey, guess what, guys? You're all going to run and hide. You're all going to betray me. In fact, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to have three opportunities to say, I am special. I am someone you love. I am the king of kings. I'm the Lord of lords. I'm the savior. I am God in the flesh. You're going to have three opportunities, and you're going to deny me three times. You see, Jesus, getting in this situation, knew all of this was going to happen. He washed every single one of their feet. Humility isn't about who deserves it because Jesus was humble and those people didn't deserve it. But they needed it. And so when you think about Thanksgiving, what that looks like, understand that humbleness, humble service flows from a grateful heart. If we're grateful for who God is, if we're grateful for what Jesus has done, then humble service will be the only thing that will flow from that. 
So, some, so maybe you're, you're a person that needs to clean up someone else's mess. Maybe it's washing the dishes every single time when no one ever says thank you or no one else will do it. I'm not saying it's okay. Stu- kids, students, if your mom and dad, if they're the ones washing dishes all the time and you're not doing it, you've got to change something. But maybe you're the one that, that doesn't get the recognition. God sees you. So going into this Thanksgiving, I want you to ask yourself, where is God calling me to pick up a towel? Whose feet is God calling me to wash? Which act of humble service is God calling me to do because it flows from a place of a grateful heart? Here's the thing. There's no act of serving anyone else. There's no act of service that is beneath us because it wasn't beneath Jesus. Next. Thankfulness is staying clean through confession. I want us to look at verse 10 and 11. Thankfulness is staying clean through confession. It says this. Jesus answered. So so Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. He says, if you're going to wash my feet, you got to wash all of me because I, I, I want to be clean all the way around. And verse 10, Jesus answered. He says, those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. It's like, hey, don't you understand the custom, Peter? Like this, when people come into your home, you wash their feet because they're already clean. They, they, they've taken a bath. But every day they walk in the muck and the mire and the dirt. They walk in everything. And so the feet are what need to be, needs to be clean. He says their whole body is clean. And he looks and he says, you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. Okay, so Jesus here in this moment, he says those who needed, who've had a bath, those who've already been washed clean internally by me, those who've been justified, Romans 8, 1 says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It says those who stand before God and wear my righteousness, they don't need their whole body washed. They just need their feet washed on a daily basis because they're walking around in sin every day. But they're eternally justified. They're eternally righteous. Thankfulness is staying clean through confession. I want you to think about it like this. What do I have here? Cell phone, right? You can see the cell phone. What happens if I use this phone for five days and don't ever put it on the charger? The phone dies. And I can't make calls. I can't. I can't text, I can't message, I can't, I can't keep up with everybody's posts on Facebook and Instagram. The battery is there. There's a battery, there's an internal battery. But if I don't charge it, on a daily basis I lose the connection. That's what's happening here. Jesus says, you've got an eternal battery in you. But until you get to a place where you're living in eternity, you got to keep plugging in every day. You got to keep charging up. You got to make sure that you are engaged in confession of our sin. Thankfulness is staying clean through confession. We can't fully embrace gratitude if sin clutters our heart. You believe that? I do. It's really hard for me to be thankful for people when I'm holding on to bitterness. It's really hard for me to have a good day and go serve someone here when I know that there's this thing in my heart that I'm holding against that person over there. And you know what it is. You can fill in the blank. We can't fully embrace gratitude if sin clutters our hearts. But what's really awesome is that Jesus gave us a way to be free from the sin that's cluttering our hearts. He actually challenged us and charges us in 1 John. It says in 1 John 8, 1, 8, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He's like, you've got to be real with yourselves, people. We have to be real. Like, We have sin in our life. Like there is no one here who's not sinning on a daily basis. And it's about acknowledging that sin. 
when we acknowledge that we've got sin that's cluttering our heart, that's keeping us from being grateful and being grateful and thankful, that's when we can do something about it. And Jesus tells us, he says, if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, when we, when we allow the clutter in our hearts, it's like running around with a cell phone that's not being charged. It's useless. No one can use the phone, me or anybody else. But if we confess our sins. I was talking, we were talking to Dariella last night. She's our six-year-old. And she was trying to understand, she's been begging if she could take part. Don't tell her I talked about this. She hate, they hate when we talk about them. But she's been begging to take part in communion today. We've, we've gone through a bunch of iterations of it, and she always wants to, can I do the bread and the cup? Can I take part? Can I do it? Can I do it? No, Darielle, you're not ready. You're not ready. And we talked about this idea, and I told her my favorite verse, Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord he, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And she said, I said, do you believe that? And she said, what's confess? I say, it's to say the same thing as, or it's to say the truth that God already knows. If we tell God what he already knows about our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. We can't be grateful people with sin cluttering our hearts. So thankfulness is staying clean through confession. And then finally, as we finish out here, thankfulness is following Jesus' example because here's the truth, friends. We can believe and know all that stuff. We can love, we can serve, we can confess. But ultimately, following what Jesus says to do is the greatest form of thankfulness. You know, you've heard it said, uh, what is it? Imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Have you heard that? I think even better than that. Thankfulness or following someone, imitating someone is the greatest form of thankfulness. So let's look and see what it says here in John, in John chapter 13, verse 12. It says, when he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he looks at him, he says, do you understand what I've done for you? See, Jesus was really cool about this, okay? He didn't just do things and then walk away and be like, hope you get it. No, he looks at him and he says, okay, I did this really crazy thing. Like, like you guys, your minds are blown. You don't get it. Do you understand why I've done what I've done? In verse 13, it says, you call me teacher and Lord. And rightly so, I am a teacher and I am Lord. For that is what I am now that I. Okay, so if you call me teacher, if you call me Lord, you say I'm in charge, you say I make the rules. He says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, what does it say? You also should wash one another's feet. You've got to follow my example. You've got to do what I've called you to do. And he continues, he says, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Okay, why do we as the Karis Fellowship, why do we here at Bridge Church, when we take part in communion, and by the way, this whole place of John 13, it's happening all in the context of, of the, the bread and the cup. It's happening all in the context of this same idea where Jesus was doing all three parts, the love feast, the, the breaking of the bread and the communion, and it's washing the feet. And he says, and I've, I've set an example, that word in the Greek, example, I've set a pattern. I've set something up in your life that you should follow and you should be doing. He said, you should do as I've done for you. Now, I could get into the Greek on this. I could get into the stuff here that says, you know, you also should wash and talk about subjunct subjunctives and uh, passives and actives and all these indicatives and all these different things. But here's what you need to know. This was a little more than a, this is something you should think about. But it wasn't quite on the level of, you must do this. It was more on the place of, if you understand, then you should feel obligated to do this. If you understand, this should be normal for you. This should be a, a pattern in your life. You should do it as I've done for you. And he says, very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Why do we follow this? Why do we do this in our threefold communion? Why do we wash feet? Because I want to make you as awkward as possible. 
No. I remember when I was a kid and we had to do this at my mom and dad's church. I hated it. Hated it. I have an older brother who's 18 months older. Actually, today's his birthday. Happy birthday, Ben. I did whatever I could to be next in line after him because I wanted to wash his feet. I didn't want to touch anybody else. Why do we do this stuff? Because Jesus said we should. And when he said, you should do as I have done for you, what did he do? He physically washed their feet, but he also lived a humble life of service for those who didn't deserve his love. Are we doing that? If we live that way, we're going to be blessed. He says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if what? You do them. You won't feel blessed. You will be blessed. Because thankfulness isn't just about what we feel. It's about what we do with what we've been given. What have you been given? I know what I've been given. I've been given a wife. I've been given kids. I've been given a wonderful family. I've been given an amazing church that loves me like crazy. I love you guys for it. But the greatest thing that I'm thankful for is knowing that I'm going to have an eternity in heaven because of what Jesus has done for me because I couldn't have done it on my own. Thankfulness isn't just about what I feel because I don't always feel like a Christian. I don't always feel like a disciple. Thankfulness is about what I do with this gift that I've been giving. So what are we doing? You see this towel as I washed Josh's feet earlier. Jesus washed their feet. He carried their filth around. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He carried the the filth of Judas as his betrayer. He carried the filth of Peter as the denier. He carried the filth of those who murdered him on the cross. And he carries the filth of my sin. And he carried it to the cross. But every single day we need to understand that we can daily cleanse. We can daily be in a place where where if I confess my sin to Jesus, as I I tell him what he already knows because he's already carrying it. He's already got it there. As I tell him already that, then he puts us in a place where we're connected and we're in a right relationship. And we can understand and we can function the way he's called us to function because we don't have anything in our conscience that's saying, I'm not good enough to do that. I can't do that. I can't speak to that person. I can't, I, I can't be kind to that person because I was already mean to that person over there. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to purify us, to put us in a place where we can do what he's called us to do. Thankfulness isn't just about what we feel. It's about understanding that we do things for him out of the gratefulness of our heart. And so what are we going to do going forward this week? Worship team, you can come up. What are we going to do going forward? We're going to remember to give thanks. We're going to remember every single time we see one of these things on our table, every time we see a decoration, every time we see something that says happy Thanksgiving or the happy holidays stuff, you know? Every time we see it, we're going to love even when it's hard to love. We're going to serve even when it's hard to serve. We're going to confess. Why? Why are we going to confess our sin? To stay clean and connected, to stay charged up. And we're going to live out our gratitude this week. Because that's what Jesus wants. Living as his disciples were people who live from a place of gratitude. Isn't it awesome? 
We don't have to live from a place of hopelessness. We don't have to live from a place of like bitterness. We don't have to be stuck in this pain and this turmoil and this hope. All this stuff. We can be in a place where we say, wow, like I, I got to remember that Jesus knelt down and he washed their feet. And if I were there that day, he would have washed mine, even though he knew that I broke his heart the day before. Even though he knew that I'm going to break his heart tomorrow, he still washed my feet and he told me I was wholly clean. Because he knew that it was his perfection on the cross that could purify me for eternity. Now, we're going to celebrate this in a little bit. But here's the thing. I chose this next song. He shall reign forevermore. Because that's the picture of the king of kings. He was a servant for us. But even this servant king, is, is he's on the throne right now. He's reigning right now. He's going forward. And for all of eternity, Jesus is in charge. Because God placed everything under his feet. God placed everything under his power. And he still serves us. He still loves us. He still wants you to be engaged in his life. He still wants you to be giving to him. He wants you to be grateful. Because from a heart of gratefulness is when we fulfill our our full purpose. Do you want to be those kind of people this Thanksgiving? I want to be. I want to be that. I want to love. I want to serve. I want to confess. And then I'm going to live out of a place of gratefulness. Will you stand with us as we celebrate our Lord who's given us this opportunity. We celebrate him being the king.